Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all for being here and uh, being being here on time <laughs> to try to help us recoup a bit of the of the overtime that we've we found ourselves in. There's just uh, so much to discuss, obviously, for this very important topic. Um, so, good afternoon. Um, I am not Zahra Babar, as it says in your program. Unfortunately, she had to attend to an urgent matter. My name is Elizabeth Wanucha. I am the Assistant Director uh, of uh, Operations and Research Support at the Center for International and Regional Studies here at Georgetown University in Qatar. Um, I'm very fortunate that she takes really good notes, and so I'll be, <laughs> I'll be reading a bit. Please forgive me, um, but you all are here to to listen to our speakers, not, not to me. Um, so uh, this panel will be exploring the impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine on the Middle East and Gulf states. The ongoing conflict has reverberated across the globe, reshaping political and economic landscapes, and the Middle East is no exception. So in this panel, we will examine three key dimensions of the ongoing war, the implications for Middle Eastern regional security, the economic opportunities and challenges emerging from the conflict, especially in relation to the energy market and how strategic calculations may have altered long-standing alliances and partnerships. These issues are of critical, uh, critical importance as the war continues to impact not only those in the immediate neighborhood of Ukraine, but also the broader regional and international order. And we're fortunate uh, to have with us today a distinguished group of experts who will share their insights. First, uh, Karim Hagag is the director of the Middle East Studies Center at the American University in Cairo. With over 25 years of experience in Egypt's diplomatic corps, he has held various significant roles focusing on U.S.-Egyptian relations, regional security, and Arab-Israeli diplomacy. His extensive experience includes serving in Cairo's office of the presidency and at Egypt's embassy in Washington, where he worked on political military affairs and the Middle East peace process. Shaban Kardas serves as a research professor and program coordinator at the Gulf Studies Center at Qatar University. His research covers Turkish domestic and foreign policies, energy strategies, and international security, and he has contributed to leading international media outlets. Nikolai Koshanov, who we are, have seen this, uh, several times today already, is a research professor at the Gulf Studies Center at Qatar University. He's also a non-resident scholar at the Middle East Institute and a consulting fellow at Chatham House. His work focuses on the geopolitics of hydrocarbons in the Gulf, Russian foreign policy in the region, and Iran's international relations. Lee Chen Sim is an assistant professor at Khalifa University in the UAE and a non-resident scholar at the US Middle East Institute. Her expertise lies in the intersection of hydrocarbon and low carbon energy policies with international relations in the Gulf. She has authored several books and published in top tier, top -tier journals. Finally, we have Ali Al-Ali. He is a PhD candidate and researcher at the Center for International Policy Research. Ali will address the Qatari perspective on the war in Ukraine and Qatar's foreign policy engagements with both Russia and Ukraine. So I will turn the floor over to, uh, to Karim. Um, and today, he will shed light on the diverse approaches with, within the Arab world towards the Ukraine conflict. Thank you very much. Is this working? Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth, and thank you to the University of Qatar uh, and uh, Georgetown University for hosting uh, this very important event. Uh, it's wonderful to be here with you all today, and thank you all for uh, for joining this session. So uh, I think as, as a point of departure, I, I think there's an argument to be made that the Arab region specifically, but the, the Middle East more broadly, was one of the most affected regions uh, from this conflict. And this is really a function of the many linkages, the complex linkages tying uh, the, the actors in, in the region to uh, the European uh, theater, uh, but also the, the key actors involved in, in the war in Ukraine. So the, the political linkages, I mean, we, we have very deep relationships between uh, the region and the main actors uh, in this conflict, uh, Russia, the United States, uh, Europe. Uh, we have very deep economic linkages, uh, the ties of trade, investment, supply chains, 
And I think we, we can't forget the, the many ideational linkages tying both regions. I mean, these are two regions that have had historic linkages in terms of the role of ideas, uh, in terms of commonalities, but also fault lines. Uh, so this is a very deep historic relationship. And so there are normative implications uh, uh, as well uh, playing out. And so what I would like to do is, is try and unpack the impacts of uh, this conflict uh, in uh, assessing three broad trends uh, that have played out uh, with regards to the relationship uh, between the region and how it related to this war. And many of these trends uh, pre-existed the conflict uh, in Ukraine. So first, on the political diplomatic front, uh, I think the key point to be made here was that the war in Ukraine was an opportunity for the region's middle powers to expand and assert their margin of diplomatic and strategic hedging. Not just vis-a-vis -vis the United States and Russia, but also with respect to China, as we've heard extensively in, in the previous panel. And this was manifested in numerous ways. I think I initially we saw this in the voting patterns uh, on the part of key Arab states with regards to the UN resolutions related to the war. And the voting record was mixed. You had uh, certain Arab states voting in favor of the initial resolutions condemning the uh, invasion, Russian invasion of Ukraine. We saw that with Egypt, we saw that with Saudi Arabia, we saw that with uh, Kuwait, we saw that with Qatar. And there were certain countries that voted against uh, the, the condemnation, uh, primarily Algeria uh, and uh, Syria. The League of Arab States officially adopted a neutral position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the conflict, urging an end to the war and a diplomatic resolution uh, to the conflict, emphasizing the need for compromise. So very much a neutral uh, posture vis-a-vis uh, -vis the ongoing conflict. But beyond the initial resolutions, I think almost all Arab states voted against the series of follow-on resolutions that were seen to be uh, punitive against Russia. So the, the resolutions uh, to expel Russia from the uh, Human Rights Council and the United Nations, certainly not uh, signing up to the uh, sanctions regime uh, that, that was instituted outside uh, of the United Nations. But I think the key point here is that irrespective of how countries actually voted uh, on these issues, you find a situation in which all states took very great care to insulate uh, all of this from their relationships with both uh, the United States uh, and Russia. So even those who voted in favor of condemning Russia ensured that this voting did not actually affect their historic ties uh, with Russia. This certainly was the case with respect to Egypt, given uh, the very close uh, relationship, deep relationship that Egypt now enjoys uh, with Moscow, and at the same time preserving the very strategic relationship that Egypt has uh, with the United States. So this, all of this was reflective of a growing independence, a growing transactional approach, trying to maximize the benefit uh, that states get from these relationships. And it was not just manifested in the voting record. I mean, we saw the very assertive uh, diplomacy on the part of countries in the region uh, with respect to the issues related to the war. So we found a very assertive oil diplomacy on the part of the Gulf states. Maybe uh, Dr. Ali can speak to this in the context of OPEC Plus, for example. The recent expansion of the BRICS group, uh, three out of the four new states that were admitted to BRICS were from the Middle East, Iran, Egypt, uh, and the UAE. So we, we see this uh, very assertive approach that emphasized and underscored uh, the uh, independence and uh, the margin of maneuver uh, that, that countries wanted to um, uh, affirm with respect to this conflict. This very much translated into a neutralist approach, and it, I think, uh, re was reflective of a trend uh, that has been ongoing in the region for some time to diversify the strategic relationships with the great powers. So this is why we see 
the emphasis on neutrality, on the transactional nature that in, in terms of how countries of the region structure uh, their ties with uh, the great powers, their neutral posture vis-a-vis -vis the whole issue of great power competition. And I think I, I'm, I'm mindful to connect this with uh, the very astute comments made by Jonathan Fulton uh, in the previous uh, session in which he um, referred to China's desire to structure a shadow order, a shadow global order that can rival the Western dominated order. I think with respect to countries in the region, their posture is not so much with looking to affect uh, change at the global level, but it really is to maximize the benefit that they gain from uh, these relationships uh, moving forward. I think secondly, we saw a very pronounced socio-economic impact with regards to uh, the, the war on uh, the region. A and this was very much a function of the vulnerability of certain states in the region to global shocks. Uh, it revealed a certain level of socio-political, uh, socio-economic fragility. And we saw this, of course, with the food crisis that developed as a result of uh, the war. So here we have a situation in which the two highest exporting states of, of grain globally, Ukraine uh, and, and Russia, and uh, the, the, country, uh, the one country in the region that is the highest importer of grain, which is Egypt. And so that, uh, in the intersection of these two uh, uh, realities really exposed the degree of vulnerability uh, in terms of uh, the food insecurity that uh, was prevailing in certain countries, uh, Egypt primarily, but also to a lesser extent Algeria, uh, Morocco, Tunisia, other countries affected by conflict, uh, Sudan, uh, and Yemen. By the end of 2022, global food prices had gone back down to pre-conflict uh, levels, but we still see implications in terms of uh, the, the region's vulnerability to uh, food insecurity uh, moving forward. And it was not just with respect to uh, the issue of food security. We saw disruptions in global capital markets. So we saw capital flight uh, from countries like Egypt, highly dependent on uh, inflows of capital to sustain uh, what has been a chronic deficit in terms of the uh, balance of payments in the Egyptian economy. We saw Egypt's tourist sector uh, heavily impacted by uh, the war in Ukraine. So not only does Egypt get most of its grain from Russia and Ukraine, it gets most of its tourists from uh, both uh, countries. And so all, all of this was important to assess and to track because, of course, we are all mindful of the socioeconomic precursors to, uh, that led to the Arab uprisings. This is not to suggest that there is a straight line to be drawn from the food crisis that prevailed in the wake of the war to another round of Arab revolutions, but it does um, reveal the high degree of vulnerability to global shocks uh, that uh, resulted from uh, the war in Ukraine. Third, I think it's very important to uh, address the normative impact of the war and how that affected uh, the region. A and I think this will play out in complex ways, both globally and uh, regionally. And I think there, there's the, the, the way, the best way to describe this is really a contrast in two narratives. So I think the US narrative was one that focused on the fact that, that the, the, the war in Ukraine was very much a litmus test of global order. And what was at stake was the rules-based international order, and Ukraine was very much at the heart uh, of this narrative. Most countries in the region saw this conflict in different terms, that this was a regional conflict, essentially impacting the European uh, regional security order, maybe more broadly the, the Euro-Atlantic order, but that this was not really seen in terms of a global conflict affecting uh, the, the global norms. But once that um, global frame was, I think, imposed on this conflict, 
then that highlighted the issues of sovereignty, territorial integrity of states, condemnation of aggression, the non-admissibility of the use of military force to acquire and annex territory, and those were precisely the principles and norms that were most undermined historically in the Middle East. And we've seen that over the last uh, few decades with the conflicts in Iraq, Afghanistan, the NATO intervention in Libya, and of course the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So framing the war in Ukraine in these normative terms set up this very vivid contrast. And that was very much emphasized and underscored by the fact that we had the war in Ukraine increasingly play out in contrast to the war in Gaza. The fact that we had these two wars play out simultaneously set up this uh, split-screen image in which those same principles played out in very different contexts with very different standards. And I think how, that, um, how these normative uh, implications of the conflict play out in the future, I think will be very interesting to watch. I think th this was encapsulated by a very powerful, uh, what I thought was a powerful quote by the European High Representative Borrell when he referred to Gaza as the graveyard of international humanitarian law. Now, this is not a statement related to Ukraine but it comes against the backdrop of the conflict in Ukraine and the way it has been framed in these normative uh, terms. So I think how that, that normative dimension plays out, I think will be very interesting to watch. Last comment relates to the future potential strategic implications of this conflict. We've seen very interesting linkages by which countries of the region play a very direct and sometimes indirect role with, re with regards to what is a European conflict. It used to be the other way around. But we saw countries like Turkey uh, supply military aid to Ukraine. We saw uh, Iran supply also military for different forms of military assistance to Russia. We saw very interesting mediation uh, roles being played by Turkey with regards to the Black Sea grain deal with Gulf countries playing a mediating role in negotiating hostage ex exchanges and return of children. And it used to be the other way around, where it was countries of the West intervening diplomatically and mi militarily in, the, in our region's conflicts. So I think that this sets up, I think, a, an important uh, conversation about the future strategic implications of the conflict. So if one were to speculate, if we get to a negotiated settlement for the conflict in Ukraine that involves, for example, uh, Western security guarantees or assurances uh, for Ukraine, that sets up an interesting precedent whereby similar guarantees can be offered by the United States to countries of the Gulf, for example. If the war in Ukraine coincides with an all-out regional conflict uh, in the Middle East, uh, for example, then we can have what could be a very interesting but also troubling interaction between two strategic theaters of conflict um, impacting each other in ways that I think could be highly destabilizing. So I think that to, to, to offer maybe a final point when we talk about impacts of the war, the impacts flow two ways. Yes, the, the war in Ukraine has certainly impacted uh, the Arab region and, and the Middle East more broadly, but we also see impacts flowing the other way uh, as well. Let me end there. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Shaban will provide a deep dive into Turkey's evolving policy in response to Russia's actions in Ukraine contextualizing it within the broader framework of Turkish-Russian relations. Okay, thank you. Does it work, the mic? You can hear me? Great. Yeah, uh, that's a good introduction to my own presentation as well. But uh, before getting into how the Turkish policy evolved, let me put forward a couple of uh, parameters, concepts, to better make sense of uh, Turkish response throughout the crisis, we usually have a discussion how to define Turkey, whether it's a Middle Eastern country, European, uh, Black Sea actor. 
And then uh, from a conceptual uh, point of view, uh, there is a growing literature to call it a kind of uh, middle power, emerging middle power. But personally, I tend to call it a regional power, but rather a multi-regional power, which reflects the fact that Turkey is part of different regional uh, realities, contexts, subsystems simultaneously, in the sense that Turkey is subject to the security uh, interdependencies in different regions at the same time. So this is important to understand how uh, Turkey was responding uh, to the uh, Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict. But also uh, it is a multi-regional power which is unique in the sense that it is deeply integrated into the uh, transatlantic security community through its membership into uh, NATO and other uh, transatlantic economic, uh, political, and security organizations. But it's a strange country in the sense that although it has been uh, a member of uh, NATO for decades, it still experiences problem with its own NATO allies, including the United uh, States. And it has been troubled by the way the United States, in specific West in uh, general, penetrated into its own neighborhoods, as we have seen in the case of the Iraqi invasion by the United States 2003 or earlier. So uh, these uh, broader concerns uh, are important to understand how Turkey responded to the conflict. So we usually use this concept of strategic autonomy in the sense that when there is a crisis, Turkey reads it through its own lenses, security lenses, its own definition of it is uh, national interests. And this is where uh, the Turkish policy has been difficult to uh, define uh, in the course of the conflict. This is where the Turkish policy has also gained some uh, fans, but also critics, uh, I would say, as we, uh, we will uh, see in a second. Uh, through some actions, uh, Turkey was supporting uh, Ukraine, the Ukrainian uh, rights, the normative order, but through its geopolitical acts, more realist acts, Turkey also maintained its ties with the Russian uh, side, it did not uh, severe the diplomatic sides, and maintained the economic collaboration, which created another set of problems. So from the Turkish point of view, we see the uh, challenges, uh, the conflict presented not only to the European order, but to the international uh, order at large. And the way I personally see the problem did not start, of course, in 2020, February, but it started maybe 2014, even we go back to 2008, if not uh, earlier, with the Russian uh, invasion of uh, Georgia. So what was the issue, as was also mentioned in the first panel, uh, I tend to agree with uh, Stefan uh, in the sense that that's the Russian uh, revisionism uh, or neo-revisionism, and the question is how to deal with it. But the reality was that, unfortunately, many of the Western actors that are still debating uh, how to respond to it, they prefer to escape from geopolitics, I tend to call it, escape from geopolitics, uh, try to look the other way around uh, when Russian uh, revisionism was on the rise earlier than 2008, but obviously uh, became very uh, crystallized in the case of 2008 Russian invasion of uh, Georgia. So in the European uh, context, different countries developed their own ways to respond to this, and Turkey did its own response in the context of its own realities with Russia. So the way uh, Turkey uh, responded to it, to some extent Turkey ignored the Russian revisionism. Uh, to some extent, Turkey looked the other way around. To some extent, accommodated to this uh, reality, but uh, to some extent, tried to respond to it in its own unique ways. And this is what we call a compartmentalized foreign policy. We use this concept in the context of Turkish-Russian relations, and especially also Turkish-Iranian uh, relations. Focus on areas of uh, converging interests, and leave aside the areas of divergence, compartmentalize your uh, own relations. So in that sense that Turkey uh, tried to avoid, the Europeans uh, avoided, uh, NATO avoided. After 2008, uh, NATO-Russia dialogue was canceled, but it was again brought back. We know what happened. Uh, accommodating Russia in the European order, a new security order didn't work, and we ended up with 2022. So when it happened, the way Turkey uh, responded, 
Of course, there were also other normative considerations. I mean, this uh, Western hypocrisy on the normative order didn't start with Gaza. We have seen a decade of conflict in Syria. Turkey was the first country to uh, bear the burden of this uh, collapse of the normative order. And then we have seen what happened. So when the uh, conflict started, as was mentioned, Turkey did try to uh, take some action uh, to support the Ukrainian arguments legally as well. For instance, the UN General Assembly resolution you mentioned was also uh, sponsored by uh, Turkey on other files as well, continuing the uh, arms deliveries to Ukraine, but at the same time maintaining uh, the economic ties. So the way uh, Turkey acted in this crisis was again through its own uh, optics, uh, I would uh, like to reiterate, because uh, the multiple ties, multiple files with Russia were there to preserve. Okay, the conflict wasn't something to be accepted, but the level degree of economic cooperation, financial uh, cooperation, energy cooperation, with Russia was so deep that Turkey couldn't just ignore it just because Europeans just now woke up to this new geopolitical reality. Why were the Europeans not taking the necessary actions uh, all these years to undercut their energy dependence on Russia? Starting from six, 2006, 7, 8, we had a lot of alternative uh, projects, but they did nothing. Instead, Turkey had to deepen the energy partnership with Russia. 2022, suddenly the Europeans are waking up to the new geopolitical reality, asking Turkey to cut all energy ties. Sorry, but it doesn't work this way. It didn't work this way. So Turkey maintained its relations with Russia, but at the same time uh, kept uh, also supporting the Ukrainian uh, legal arguments at the international uh, forums and kept supplying the weapons. And, and in this uh, case, I would say the biggest concern for Turkey was uh, to maintain the broader strategic balance in the Black Sea uh, regional context. In the Turkish geopolitical thinking, the Black Sea balance, which was structured around the Montreux regime, is very important to maintain Turkey's own uh, broader strategic interests. I guess this was big. And then the experience of Iraq was very important here. Uh, when the Americans get into our neighborhood, Rather than fixing the problems, they leave a mess behind. So don't repeat. So it was a very simple lesson learned experience, memory, short memory. But it was also, unfortunately, a memory from the late Ottoman period in the sense that don't get stuck in the great powers war. So this is the way, unfortunately, our Ukrainian colleagues uh, keep repeating this argument. We are defending the international order. The war is not just about this or that. But if it is a war between the West and East or West and Russia, you better take care of yourself. This is the lesson we learned 100 years ago. So this is how we were reacting. But going back to the discussions in the morning, whether uh, Mr. Putin was justified, what was the reasons for the war invasion. But geopolitics 101, realism 101, prudence, the implications of your actions. Don't do stupid things, as Obama used to also say in Syria. Don't do stupid things. So when the glass is broken, so you can go back to questioning of why it happened, how it happened. Was it because of Putin's own personality? He was isolated from his decision-making circles or whatever. Was it because of the historical nostalgia? It doesn't matter. The glass is broken. So I think throughout the crisis, what was shaping uh, the Turkish politics from it is our own... Uh, uh, point of view, don't get the br uh, glass broken. This was the lesson I guess uh, Turks were also trying to give to the Ukrainians. It may sound like accommodating, but sometimes this may be what you have to do. So this is uh, shaping, the, this has been shaping the Turkish reaction. Uh, Ariel used the concept of uh, fancy thing. Yeah, I mean, this still, uh, we are uh, trying to, from a theoretical point of view, properly describe uh, the Turkish policy. Was Turkey fancy thing in this crisis? Was it hedging? Is it uh, bandwagoning with Russia? Is it taking a, a position against Russia? Personally, I mean, from the very beginning, I have been arguing it's a cautious, cautious counterbalancing of Russia. We realize what Russia does is not right. But the way you respond to Russia, Russia's own mistakes don't justify your own mistakes as well. So it is about 
carefully, cautiously handling uh, this challenge. If it's a declining Russia, if it's a declining empire in later stages, you need to learn how to live with it. You need to uh, handle this last phase of this uh, declining empire properly. I guess this is what Turkey has been trying to do, minimize the costs to the regional order in the Black Sea and the regional order uh, in the broader transatlantic area. And this is why, despite its support for Ukraine, Turkey has also taken actions to limit the Western reaction, limit the Western involvement in the Black Sea. This is a part of this historical legacy learned experiences of a century and longer to keep the great power conflict away from your own neighborhood. I guess we are still getting angry. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And Nikolai will offer insights into how Iran's foreign policy has adapted in light of the ongoing conflict. Here we go. <laughs> Uh, well, I just recording a good friend of mine who's been studying Iran for 25 years. He was telling me I spent 25 years reading Iran and 10 years living in Iran, and I still don't understand how it's functioning. So I'm afraid I have some. Uh, I'll try to offer my insights, and moreover, I was not initially supposed to speak, but uh, due to some reasons, I had to take this role um, of. Uh, Russian speaking about Iran, what can go wrong? Uh, so uh, uh, one of the main like topics on which I wanted to concentrate and partly is the continuation of uh, what was told by Dr. Shaban is uh, narratives that sometimes exist and sometimes that they are either simplifying reality or non on the opposite, like um, uh, doing it more complex. Um, and the same could be applied to basically Russia's relations with Iran, because uh, after the beginning of Putin's war in Ukraine, uh, they were often uh, labeled as a kind of a newborn alliance. And uh, that's where I must express my disagreement with two points, both that it's alliance and it emerged uh, after the beginning of the war. Uh, first of all, what we see on the ground, that basically the uh, background for uh, forging these relations is started to emerge long before uh, the uh, war in Ukraine. Uh, first of all, we definitely see uh, how very gradually, very slowly, uh, the pro-Russian lobby was formed within Iran after the uh, military, Russian military deployment in Syria. And already on the military level, you have uh, certain contacts between Russian military, the IRGC people, uh, Iranian military emerging that were uh, creating finally what was absent from the, uh, the picture of Russian-Iranian relations for many decades, the lobby that could be interested in uh, these relations. Second, uh, by um, the, 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 the 2022, we had a substantial um, reshuffle in the political accents on the Iranian scene. We see the conservative forces being more and more in force and marginalizing those, um, uh, let's call them reformist, moderate forces, uh, though they cannot be formulated as that in the proper meaning, um, being marginalized from the decision-making process. And naturally, uh, the conservative or new conservative forces, they were famous for being more inclined towards the uh, cooperation, interaction with Russia. And that's what we see emerging with the rise of the late President Raisi on the political scene. Of course, it was not his decision to go towards Russia. It was the decision made by the Supreme Leader, who clearly formulated that um, though the certain part, substantial part of the Iranian political elite of the Iranian uh, public was critical about this decision. But he formulated the idea that we need to get uh, close to Moscow and Raisi and the late uh, foreign minister of Iran, they formed again the force that was partly behind the implementation of this uh, idea. Uh, not to say that uh, by 2022 there was a substantial disappointment in Iran and the idea of rapprochement with the West and uh, in the idea of uh, that uh, actually the revival of the GCPOA or any diffusal of these tensions can bring to the improvement 
uh, of uh, relations with the West or lead to the substantial economic improvement. Uh, they were basically learning from the story of 2015-2019 when the assignment of the GCPOA was, uh, gave almost nothing to the Iranian economy. And uh, again, it was naturally turning the country towards China, towards Russia. Uh, not to say that there was a background created already in interaction on regional uh, questions, uh, on um, uh, the, uh, in, the, in the field of um, certain economic cooperation, uh, as well as there was, of course, such a thing like both of the countries, they were trying to use each other as a big bargaining chip in the relations. So, which of course is creating a wedge, but at the same time putting them on the same platform. What changed with the beginning of the war in Ukraine? Uh, first of all, uh, this war was fitting in the ideological vision that existed in Tehran by, the, by that moment. Uh, whether we like it or not, whether we agree with this or not, so, but uh, Iran started to believe that it's beginning of the uh, construction of a new world order. So the main uh, ideological, the main philosophical idea between uh, the Iranian stance was that actually uh, after the war in Ukraine, we will see the decline of the US and Iran will be winning. And of course, uh, it wanted to see uh, uh, to be at the part of this new world. It wanted to, to see, uh, it believed that Russia is going to be a, one of the constructor of this world. And partly these beliefs, it was justified by the fact that Russia started helping Iran to join SEO, to be more active in BRICS, to be more interactive with the Eurasian Economic Union. Uh, secondly, uh, from the ideological point of view, Iran finally got a guarantee that Russia is not going to betray it. So basically the main concerns before was that Iran could be easily traded and there was a reason for this. We need to accept that Russia not once, even within the last 30 years, were betraying Iran and those agreements were, that were signed with this country. Uh, but the depths of the rifts between Russia and the West after the beginning of the war they so, were so deep that there was little doubt that there, were, that there will be any chances of return of the situation to the previous uh, stance. And finally, uh, uh, the war put, uh, from the Iranian point of view, uh, Russia and Iran in the same trench of the anti-Western coalition. Uh, in practical aspects, it also found its uh, manifestation. First of all, and it's interesting, it's not even the military cooperation, but it's the growing importance of Iran as a transportation hub that was allowing Russia to redirect all its uh, external trade towards Asia that acquired its importance. I, I would like to remind you that on the first, on the, uh, when it became clear that the Russian blitzkrieg in Ukraine failed, the first thing that the uh, Moscow was discussing with uh, Tehran was not arms supplies, was the revival of so-called international uh, transport corridor north-south, because it was obvious uh, for Moscow that the reality is changing and that there, there are solutions that must be applied. Uh, second, of course, is the arms supplies. And it's quite interesting that they basically changed the balance of power. So if before Russia was generally considered as a supplier of arms to Iran, now Russia became the consumer. And it has a strategic importance for these relations because they uh, basically uh, changed uh, the perception of uh, Moscow in Tehran. If before that Moscow could see it as a bigger brother that could dictate something to Iran, now it became equal, became more dependent and became more vulnerable in terms of the interaction with Tehran. Uh, thirdly, definitely uh, Iran became a teacher of how to evade sanctions. I mean, I don't want to spend the, uh, the time on this and it will take 1001 night story. But those um, uh, methods that Russia is using right now is the augmented version of the Iranian experience. And from this point of view, Iran saved time for Russia. So instead of 30 years of learning how to uh, evade sanctions, they to it took them less than a month to take the Iranian experience, improve it, and implement it. Uh, and uh, finally, um, what we also can see what happened in, in practice, that both countries, they realize that in the new realities, they have no other way but to uh, cooperate. And this cooperation should have a practical base. So what we see right now, they are not uh, working on the new sound projects, 
but rather they are getting focused on the careful implementation of what has already been negotiated. Those projects that are currently presented by the Iranians and the Russians and their propaganda is something new. I heard about them since 1999, when I first opened the book and started studying Iran and what it means for Russia. So with the only difference that right now the chance for them to be implemented was given. And that's where I probably had to uh, draw quite a rosy picture and uh, I'm afraid some of my colleagues in the audience will criticize me for this, so it's a high time to give some criticism. And yet it's not an alliance, and that's where I'm moving to the second part. First of all, uh, in terms of strategic thinking, we need to understand that we're dealing with two countries, different countries. One is still has ambitions to be a global power. It can be declining, it can be uh, frozen, it can be in its mind in the 18th century, it's still an empire and it's trying to play a global role. The other player is pretending to play a regional role. So by default, the goals might be overlapping but not matching for 100% on the one hand. On the other hand, one country with the global ambitions can provide the protection at the international arena, but in terms of the situation on the ground exactly in the region, it's much more advanced and may follow the different goals. And this is quite clear in the situation in Syria. So the two countries, they of course supporting the survival of the Assad regime, but at the same time Russia is trying to keep distance when it comes to Israel-Iranian relations. Second, there is a natural mistrust between the two countries. Uh, both of these countries, they have a long, long memory. If I'm not mistaken, in the Arabic it's called Kemal memory sometimes. So they we remember very well what was done before and you can stop a taxi in Tehran and ask uh, a driver what he thinks about Russia, he'll tell you, yeah, those people, they were shooting at the uh, Majlis with the guns in 1911, if I'm not mistaken. So, and it's part of their historical memory. Not to say that, for instance, in Persian language, you still have a saying, I, Y, Turkmanchai, which is addressing to the Turkmanchai peace agreement signed with the Russians. And it means the huge defeat, unfair defeat. So when someone is ripped off, he's usually saying this. So, and from this point of view, the same questions, they also exist in Russians, in Russian culture, in Russian approaches. And of course, this is a huge block that is not allowing these two countries to come together. Not to say when we are talking about pro-Russian lobbies, it's usually people who are least critical about Russia and Tehran. Uh, the third problem is definitely economy. The Russian economy is in decline, and you can see it clearly from the trade relations uh, between the two countries. If 10 years ago Russian experts were dominating, it was quite a complicated experts, now it's just grain, while Iran is actually exporting machinery. So the role is changing, the importance are also changing. Not to say that Russia, exhausted by sanctions, exhausted financially by the war, it has little thing, uh, little, uh, quite a limited range of products and investments that it can offer to Iran, which is also has empty coffers. Uh, the uh, third, if I'm not mistaken, thing is, of course, the necessity to balance Russia's policy towards Iran with Russia's policy towards GCC. And Russians, with all their knowledge of the region, they are not very good at this. So just recently, uh, the supported the while promising the substantial arms supplies to Tehran, they supported the GCC, correctly supported, uh, in their claims with regard to the uh, authority over several islands in the uh, Gulf. And of course, it immediately created a substantial uh, negative reaction in Tehran. And finally, uh, there is also the question of a price with which cooperation with Russia is coming. Uh, Iran's assistance uh, in Russia's war with Ukraine created a wider range uh, for reasons to impose new sanctions against Tehran. And the Iranians, they started feeling this price. So that's why the rise of the new president, Pesashkiyan, was aimed specifically at diffusing relations with the West. And we see a certain distancing in relations with Russia. But yet, whether we like it or not, depending on what stance you're taking, this is not a strategic rift. The strategic decision that Russia remains Iran's ally and vice versa is there, and the countries continue working together. 
So, and this is one of the results of the war. It didn't become a game changer in these relations. It hardly can bring these relations to a qualitatively new uh, level, but it definitely played the role of catalyst that speeded up the process that we've seen before. And that's where I would like to finish, and I'm more than happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, next, Li Chen will share her perspective on how the GCC states are navigating the economic and energy-related challenges brought about by the war, and how these dynamics are influencing their foreign policies. Thank you very much for that. Um, okay, I'm going to take my cue from what um, Kareem and Nikolai said earlier. Um, and basically, they, they, they discussed the fact that, um, according to them, uh, the trends which they both mentioned predated the Ukraine war, right? And that the Ukraine war basically just accelerated some of these trends that were apparent before the Ukraine war. I hope I've interpreted um, you correctly. So I'm going to use that same frame of analysis to say something about um, the economic implications of the war for the Gulf states, minus Qatar, because my very able panelists here will um, cover Qatar. So I'm going to break down my comments into several parts. Um, the first one is looking at hydrocarbon flows. Um, what has changed, what has not changed uh, since the war? And I will suggest that if you look at um, oil flows, right, um, you will see that the UAE, the Gulf states basically, have actually increased the exports of oil, uh, both crude and, ex uh, crude and products, to the European Union. Right? Um, if, if you look at figures, they've increased uh, quite significantly. In the case of Saudi, they've always been a big exporter of oil to Europe um, among the Gulf states. Um, but you will see this trend particularly noticeable um, in the UAE, um, even in Oman and in Kuwait. Right? Um, in the case of Oman, it's like um, their exports of oil products to Europe went up almost twofold. Right? So these are quite significant increases. So if you look at that, you will think, OK, definitely it's because of um, the uh, Ukraine war. But I would actually beg to defer because, you know, the, the supposition is that it's due to the Ukraine war because Russia was a big uh, supplier of oil to Europe and therefore um, now that there's a vacuum, the Gulf states are stepping in. But I will actually suggest a different interpretation. And from my point of view, the interpretation is that these trends, in, particularly in products, predated the war because the Gulf states, many of them had already take, uh, undertaken upgrade of their refineries uh, even before the war. Why were they doing an upgrade of refineries? Because they wanted to capture more of the value of oil. Instead of just exporting crude, they wanted to export products, which of course get you a higher margin. So even before the war, um, they had done upgrades, uh, whether it's in um, Ruiz or whether it's in Dukum. So all these upgrades to their oil refineries was actually a lucky timing. By the time they finished the upgrade or almost finishing the upgrade, the war broke out. And so there were these Gulf oil products ready to export to Europe, but there was a vacuum. Okay, so naturally, uh, we see this uptick in uh, hydrocarbon trade between the Gulf states and Europe. So that's the first trend I wanted to, to mention, which again predated the war in Ukraine. Um, the second trend I want to mention is about non-hydrocarbon trade. So I talked first about um, uh, hydrocarbon trade. If we look at non-oil trade with Russia, I think it's also quite uh, an interesting picture. Um, if you ask the Europeans, um, some of the European countries um, you know, tended to still continue trading with Russia even after the war, but via third countries, right? A very um, series of interesting graphs was by Robin Brooks, and uh, he showed that, uh, for example, German exports to Kazakhstan or Kyrgyzstan increased massively. There was a steep increase. And it was like, why would Germany want to export washing machines or cars suddenly to Kazakhstan or Kyrgyzstan after the war, uh, during the war? And so, of course, the answer was that these were countries that were being used to transit the goods eventually to Russia. Right? So that, that's the European picture. Um, but, for example, in the UAE, um, yes, there has been an ex increase in exports, uh, say, let's look at trade with Russia. There's been an increase in exports between UAE's trade with Russia in terms of non-oil trade. 
Um, but these are re-exports, right? So they are not national, what the statistics call national exports of the UAE. They're actually re-exports, so goods that came from country to the UAE and then just simply re-exported. Um, so the UAE's uh, trade, re-export trade with Russia has increased since 2020. And this uh, qualification is important because, again, it goes to show that these were pre-2022 trends, right? Um, by this time, Russia and UAE were already increasing their bilateral trade, uh, so the war just simply um, accelerated these um, pre-war trends. Now, um, the third trend I just want to speak um, briefly about, it's about people-to-people -people flows, right? Um, Karim mentioned about the importance of Russian visitors um, for Egypt, right, Egypt's economy. And um, you will see the same thing here in the Gulf. Um, Russians um, have been growing in importance um, as a source of tourism. So, for example, um, in, in Dubai, right, which is a mecca for tourism here in the Gulf, um, you'll find every year since 2017, 18, 19, um, we've got massive amounts of um, Russian tourists. Um, Pre-war, pre-2022, um, the Russian tourist market was about the sixth largest um, source market for Dubai. Um, but since then, in 2022 and 2023, something interesting has happened. Um, the number of Russian visitors is not the top market, but it's actually exceeded the number of Chinese visitors right, in 2022 and 2023. Um, and, and this is quite interesting um, because Chinese visitors were always you know, outnumbered the Russians um, greatly. But I guess in the past few years, you know, with the economic um, issues in China, there's been less spending money, so there's fewer tourists coming out. And then conversely, um, more tourists from Russia coming in as well. So from the sixth largest source market before the war, um, the Russian market uh, is, as a source market is now about the third largest um, in Dubai, right? So I, I think that's quite an interesting trend. Real for real estate? Sorry? Real estate? No, so I don't have that, and you know why? Because <laughs> it's not available, right? It's, <laughs> yeah, okay, I tried. So, um, uh, but the more interesting thing, I guess, is that these are just tourist numbers. More interesting than that is, is it's not just tourist numbers. Because um, last year, the first ever Russian international school um, in Dubai, in the UAE, was set up, right? And this was in Dubai. So when you have an international school, a Russian international school with Russian curriculum, that's a sign that the presence of these um, Russian visitors are not just temporary, right? There's more permanent, and hence there's a need for education, et cetera, for the Russian kids. So um, I think this is really something that we have to look out for, um, this increased people-to-people -people, um, traffic and a more permanent um, presence, not just for the tourists, but also in terms of Russian businesses that have relocated from Europe. Um, I have a couple of more minutes, so I just want to turn to a final trend. And again, it's something I think which Orissa um, mentioned in the first panel about lessons learned from Ukraine. And Orissa mentioned self-reliance, if I'm not mistaken, right? And so I, I want to use this and look at the fourth trend um, in terms of economic implications for the Gulf states. And I think um, one of the trends is that they have been really ratcheting up their degrees of self-reliance, particularly in terms of an indigenous supply chain, right, um, for, for the Gulf, for all kinds of products, food security, um, solar and wind components, talent, LNG vessels, you name it, right? The war simply accelerated these past trends towards a more secure and importantly, indigenous and local supply chain. I'll give you a couple examples. Food. Um, there's a, a company called the Saudi Red Sea Farms in Saudi, right? And it's an ag agriculture, high technology agriculture company that wants to grow food in the Saudi desert but using you know, greenhouse, temperature control greenhouse, so that you can grow food in proper conditions. Now, they have come up with inventions like heat blocking roofs um, that let in light, which the plants need to grow, but not the heat, which is you know, going to cause the plants to wilt in, in, in the desert heat. So this is an indigenous supply chain for food, uh, which Gulf states like Saudi have accelerated since the war because they realized there was a pandemic, you know, and so now there's this supply disruptions from the Ukraine war, which again, Karim has talked about. So this has become quite important these days. Um, it's not just the Saudis. Emiratis are doing it as well. And I think a couple of days ago, they said even they wanted to be a net food exporter. 
right? From, from being an importer, they want to be a net food exporter. So that's, that's pretty eye-opening. I'll give you another example in terms of talent, right? In terms of an indigenous supply chain. So um, uh, since, the, actually just before the war, um, a lot of the national oil companies have set up trading arms for their oil products and their crude oil. And again, it's yes, it's partly to go up the value chain because you can trade your own oil rather than to rely on third parties. But it's also a way to groom talent, right? To groom talent for economies that want to diversify. Instead of relying on third parties like Glencore and Trafigula, uh, it's much better if you can have your own people trading your own oil. So these national oil companies have all set up these units and are now engaged in the trading of oil as well, right? So it's, it's an indigenous supply chain for food, solar, um, talent, uh, even LNG vessels, you name it, shipbuilding, right? So I think in these four trends that I've highlighted, uh, again, the, the point I want to emphasize is that these trends existed before the war. Um, they were simply accelerated by the war. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, finally, Ali will address the Qatari perspective on the war in Ukraine and Qatar's foreign policy engagements with both Russia and Ukraine. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thanks everybody here, Georgetown University, Qatar University. And uh, uh, I will speak about uh, Qatar's uh, perspective on uh, Ukrainian-Russian uh, crisis. But first of all, let me talk briefly about the crisis itself, you know. For us here in the Arabic Gulf states, we are, some of us, we are small countries, some of us, we are big countries like Saudi Arabia, Oman, maybe UAE, but you know, it, for us uh, in general, uh, we have here, I can tell you about the, we, or we can talk about government's views, perfect, per, per, perspective, and public opinion. Uh, you know, in general, these countries, uh, they have a very good relationship with Ukraine, but also we have a very good relationship with Russia. Interests are here and, and, and here. Uh, uh, for us, it was a frozen conflict since years and years, and it was not, it, has, it hasn't been well managed by Europe, because for us, this is the first time that usually uh, in the Middle East, we have lots of crisis uh, cases here, wars, but this is the first time that uh, in Europe uh, there is a war. So for us it was a shock, mismanagement maybe. This is a big question. Uh, uh, but at the end for us we have interests uh, in uh, both countries, Ukraine and Russia. Uh, in general, uh, uh, if we talk about Qatar's perspective, it is between humanitarian and mediation. It is of our interest to resolve this problem. Uh, at the end, we have good relationship with Ukraine and with Russia. So we cannot uh, doing mediation and in the same time we are and sending arms to one part against another part. Uh, so, if, I have some facts about Qatar's perspective on uh, Ukrainian, Russian uh, uh, crisis. Uh, so, you know, uh, Qatar, uh, they took the, the way of diplomacy in general, but uh, it's very difficult uh, uh, because it was an European crisis. It is uh, nearby the uh, European uh, territories. Uh, for us here in Qatar, we started with the humanitarian cases. Um, um, Qatar, of course, has stood by the Charter of the United States, the, the United uh, sorry, <laughs> Nations and the established principles of the international law, including the obligation under the Charter to settle international disputes by peace means. 
I say it's states, but it's United Nations. You know, this is in French language. In French language, we say lapsus. But this is what, what I will talk about later because I was thinking a lot about these things during the first and the second panels. The double standards which are used by some Westerns, uh, Europeans, and especially the States, uh, lead me to say <laughs> the United States. This is what, and uh, so, uh, regarding the Qatar humanitarian perspective, uh, this is what uh, His Highness the Amir Sheikh Hamad bin uh, Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani expressed during the phone call received from Ukrainian President in February 2022, uh, where His Highness called on all parties to exercise restraint and resolve the dispute through constructive dialogue and diplomatic means and uh, to keep the humanitarian situation of civilians and ensuring their safety a top priority. priority. As part of, uh, of the humanitarian and charitable endeavors of the state of Qatar, in July 2023, Qatar pledged $100 million for humanitarian assistance in Ukraine for rehabilitating the health and educational infrastructures provide drinking, water, and accompanying humanitarian services, in addition to allocating 50 university scholarships during the year 2023-2024 for Ukrainian students uh, to study in Qatar. Uh, Qatar played an important humanitarian role during this crisis as it uh, succeeded in or organizing several operations to reunite Ukrainian children with their families in Ukraine as part of the ongoing mediation efforts made by Qatar to reunite families that were separated due to the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. April 2023, the state of Qatar announced the arrival of 20 Russian and Ukrainian families, including 37 children, to Doha under an integrated program aimed at providing health care and comprehensive support to these families and their children to receive medical, psychological, and social support, and indicated that the program represented an important step in helping families in the recovery processes. It is designed to provide comprehensive support that meets that meets immediate needs and also lays the foundation for long-term healing and inclusion. Note that this program is implemented in partnership with representatives of the Russian Federation and Ukraine. The return of Ukrainian children is a Qatari contribution to international security and this strengthens Qatar's diplomatic status. Maria Lvova Belova, uh, Belova, the Russian commissioner for the rights of child, says Qatar's participation in, is ina, inavailable and it is an important independent party for us. The Russian commissioner for the rights of child also adds that Russia has saved thousands of Ukrainian children from the clutches of this crisis and that there are no obstacles to their return to their relatives in Ukraine. Regarding the Qatar mediation perspective, diplomacy, uh, as you know, we heard about a, a, a delegation, it was in August 17, 2024, uh, the Washington Post revealed that the Ukraine, that Ukraine and Russia were about to send delegations to Doha to negotiate a historic agreement to stop attacks on energy infrastructures. According to what the American newspaper reported from the diplomats and informed officials, these negotiations, which took place under Qatari sponsorship, would have resulted in a partial 
ceasefire. But these indirect talks in which the Qatari worked separately with the Ukrainian and Russian delegations were disrupted following Ukraine's sudden incursion into Korsk Oblast, Western Russia, according to the officials. Uh, details of potential agreement are previously and uh, previously planned summit were not reported. Uh, we notice also that in the last meeting during the summer uh, 2024, which brought together His Highness the Emir with the President of Russian Federation, uh, Vladimir Putin, uh, Vladimir Putin thanked the Emir of Qatar for his help in resolving the humanitarian issues related to, to the Ukrainian crisis, pointing out that thanks to his mediation, it was possible to return children from both the Ukrainian and Russian sides to their families. So as you know, Qatar has a global reputation in the field of negotiations, not only between Ukraine and Russia, but rather in uh, uh, but rather, its <coughs> efforts in this field began much earlier, uh, earlier through the mediation between the states and the Taliban, Israel and Hamas, and therefore Qatar is a small country, but it plays an important role as a significant negotiator between big countries. It is known that the a negotiator always ex exchanges interests. So perhaps the negotiator can offer a communication opportunity. And it is always, always better to keep such a partner <coughs> always close in case there is a need to engage in some secret negotiations. It is more profitable and safer for Qatar, I think, to remain a mediating intervention actor. And Qatar could succeed as a mediator in Ukraine, but not alone. However, in uh, coordination with other countries working to achieve this end, the Qataris could potentially make a valuable contribution to such efforts. Uh, and as you know, Qatar has an interest in not excessively antagonizing either the West or Russia, which is consistent with Doha's foreign policy goals of fostering positive relations with almost, with almost all major actors on international stages. Uh, as a state capable of meaningfully contributing to efforts to resolve crisis between various countries, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine is the latest, the, the latest example of a conflict in which Qatar has a chance to support diplomatic initiatives to make a positive difference. So knowing the keys to negotiation and the humanitarian issue may be the secret to the success of dialogue and negotiation. And Qatar always seeks to find ways to deal with countries in order to find solutions through negotiation. And this work is part of Qatar's security strategy. Now, regarding public opinion, it was a shock for public opinion here in the Arabic Gulf states, this frozen, uh, this frozen conflict between Ukraine and Russia. But, you know, uh, it was more interesting for us to see that after the crisis in Gaza, the double standards which are used by some Western countries, especially by the United States, it, it reminds everybody here through the pronostics and the polls that I did myself with the people here in the Arabic Gulf states, everybody uh, remember the, 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 the word of Vladimir Putin when he says, the empire of lies. This is when he talks about United States, when he talks about European countries. You know, 
we are willing, we, we respect the borders. We are against invasion <coughs> of countries. But in the same time, the, the double standard, which are used by some Western countries, it makes and it, it, ask, it, will, it, will, it makes us to ask lots of questions. Why these fake values which are used in the West are not applied here in our region? Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you to all our speakers. Um, I do have some questions, but first I'll open the floor to the audience, so give you all a chance to ask uh, some questions. That gentleman there, I saw your hand first. So again, please uh, keep, keep your comment or question brief. Give us your name. And uh, thank you for an informative, informative discussion and sharing with us your ideas and experience. My name is Nazar Hilal uh, from Qatar University. My ideas or my questions uh, does not, uh, do not reflect uh, the institution I affiliated to it. Instead, rather, it is my own personal. Uh, I have three questions, uh, quickly, for Dr. Karim. The first question, so you laid out the, the three trends uh, in a perfect way, and they are very clear and simple. Do you agree with me you can add the fourth trend uh, regarding the military sub, uh, supply and armament uh, for the Middle Eastern, Middle Eastern countries and the GCC? Uh, here I'm talking about the S-400 uh, anti-missiles uh, defense systems, which uh, became a competitive uh, 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 item uh, in the military among the GCC and some of the GCC countries acquired it, as I remember or I recall, United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia, to deter or deflect the missiles uh, from the hoses uh, 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 rebels in Yemen. Uh, the second question to Dr. Shaban uh, regarding the position of the Turkey. Uh, you focus on the geopolitics. Do you think there is a difference of uh, Turkish positions under the umbrella of NATO? Uh, can you explain that? Uh, the last question for Dr. Nikolai, the, regarding the strategic thinking between, can you allow me to, see, to say that there is somehow alignment between Iran and Russia? If so, uh, this alignment, how can it reflect it to enter and enter conflict uh, in the GCC countries or the Middle East, and I'm talking here about the Gaza war, the Houthi conflicts, and the internal conflict in Syria. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's get a couple questions, and then we can uh, uh, address those. Yes. Thank you. I have a question to uh, Mr. Ali. Um, how do you feel from the academic of, uh, point of view, quoting the person against whom is the uh, uh, warrant of the International Criminal Court, Ms. Belova, uh, exactly for the case that she's been illegally kidnapped Ukrainian kids, uh, even more that she adopted illegally Ukrainian kid without any uh, um, legal, and even, I mean, that is in violation of all norms, the United Nations resolutions, and that's why Doha is mediating and returning back these kids. And her phrases are saying something like, these kids were very aggressive against us. They sang even Ukrainian anthem. That is her quote. So uh, we never thought that kids of certain years can be aggressive at home by singing their national anthem, but that is what she's saying. And you didn't say anything about uh, the Ukrainian quotes, if you're speaking about the mediation, that 19,000 of Ukrainian kids been kidnapped and illegally adopted, many of them, uh, many of them with changed names. The new investigation has been coming by the International Organizations of Human Rights just two days ago, and the journalist very fresh and constantly. So it seems to me that when you would like to speak, and that would be my question in addition to this, do you think that it is uh, okay pretending to be a mediator and neutral, at the same time um, being biased to those who are openly violating the international law. We are not speaking about the political reasoning even. We are speaking about the international law, international humanitarian law, and the United Nations resolutions of the last three years where 140 countries, not only NATO countries, 140 countries uh, voted in favor of them, including most of the uh, um, Arab countries. Thank you, Hanan. One more from our colleague there from the EU Commission. 
Thank you so much. My question, is, hello, my name is Camille Lemroe. So my question is for Dr. Nikolai. Just about, um, has there been increased cooperation between Russia and, uh, and militias within the so-called axis of resistance since the onset of the Russian invasion of Ukraine? Okay, thank you. Please, panelists, uh, go ahead. We had some directed questions and some for uh, more general statements. Just uh, the, the question directed at me by the gentleman on uh, military cooperation. Um, yes, that, that is uh, an interesting trend. I, I spoke about the drive on the part of regional countries to diversify their strategic relationships with great powers. That does include the military realm. Uh, so there is increased military and defense cooperation between Arab states and the great powers. Many of the countries in question have very deep military and defense cooperation relationships with the United States. That goes with respect to Egypt, with respect to Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the UAE. Um, th this is one area where, uh, yes, there are increasingly diversified defense relationships also with, uh, on the part of these countries, with Russia, with China, but with limits. And these limits are imposed increasingly by the United States. So for the United States, it is a very sensitive issue if that level of cooperation reaches to uh, fifth generation fighters, for example. So the, for Egypt, when there was an interest to acquire the Sukhoi 35, for example, from Russia, that was a red line. Uh, you can speak to the issue of the S-400s with, with regards to uh, Turkey. So th there are uh, increasingly stringent limits uh, that are imposed by the United States um, when it comes to its uh, partners uh, in the regions. Um, but I think related to that is the, the, the very interesting trend that I think ma many of us here touched on regarding the military cooperation between other countries, uh, Iran and, and Turkey, with regards to the protagonists of this conflict. So Turkey, Ukraine, Iran, uh, Russia. And that, I think, will be very interesting to see if that deepens and continues the longer this war goes on. Projecting forward, I, I think it will be very interesting to speculate how those relationships are deepened if we have uh, an escalation of the war in Ukraine, or if we have the regional situation in the Middle East devolve into an all-out conflict. So for example, if we, if we have a, a, a region-wide armed conflict in the Middle East, does the, re the military relationship between Russia and Iran uh, deepen? Maybe Nikolai can speak to that. Does that include the nuclear dimension? For example, if we have a regional conflict coupled with a crisis around Iran's nuclear program, does that involve uh, a changed approach on the part of Russia vis-a-vis -vis the whole nuclear question uh, in the region? These are all interesting questions to speculate on, but yes, there is a, a trend, but it's increasingly, it, it's complex, it, it, and I think it flows both ways, whereas before it, it was a one-way relationship uh, between the, the great powers and, and the region. Now, I think it's a reciprocal relationship. Uh, on that question, just to complement what uh, Karim said, I mean, the issue is not about the weapons purchases from Russia. It's not just about a policy issue, but also from an operational technical point of view. It is like inserting a USB from unknown source into your computer. Many institutions have policies against it, right? So, I mean, when you buy such advanced systems, they are also computer systems, practically you are plugging it into your own system. So we had this issue with the purchase of S-400 from Russia since our entire defense industrial base was integrated into the Western NATO uh, platforms. Just buying it, 
you can only use it as standalone. You cannot integrate it into your own existing structure, which is part of the transatlantic one. So the extent to which uh, Russia, or for that matter, China, can eventually make inroads into the Gulf uh, defense industries also depends on the systems. So those advanced systems, given their very nature, and given the fact that uh, the United States has been supplying the Gulf countries, uh, I mean, there are also all these issues about plugging an unknown uh, yeah. smart thing into your network. So that's a big one. But regarding your question about Turkey under the umbrella of NATO, I didn't quite get it because Turkey is already under the umbrella. So can you clarify your question a bit? Yeah. yeah, I mean, actually, uh, from the very beginning, uh, the way uh, NATO also responded to the crisis, Turkey was also at the forefront. But uh, bear in mind, the military alliances, they take uh, decisions collectively. So given the nature of uh, NATO's decision making, although it is a US-led uh, structure, at the end of the day, there is what we call the unanimity. So the decisions have to be uh, taken unanimously. Meaning at the end of the day, NATO policy reflects the lowest common denominator. So even if uh, some members of NATO want to take harsher positions vis-a-vis -vis Russia, others have not. We have seen these divisions within NATO. So the uh, policy, eventual policy response of NATO reflects the com uh, lowest common denominator. So when we look at the way uh, NATO responded, Turkey has been actually uh, quite proactive to mobilize different responses collectively. But we know that uh, yesterday during the workshop we had discussions old Europe versus new Europe. In Europe, there is not a single position on how to respond to the new reality, the Russian aggression around Ukraine. So quite many of the European countries have been dragging their feet already. So uh, Turkey's response has evolved within this uh, broader uh, NATO internal uh, discussions. And from its own point of view, Turkey was actually arguing for a stronger NATO response. But at the end of the day, the lowest common denominator uh, shapes NATO's response. comments I would like to make, but I'll try to keep them short. Uh, first of all, um, I uh, completely agree with Dr. Hakak uh, that um, the longer this conflict, uh, the deeper are going to be the changes. So we, uh, as opposed to like Russia's relations with uh, Europe, uh, with the US, um, rela Russia's relations with the Middle East, uh, they were accelerated boosted, but they were not like turned for 180 degrees. So, and these ad hoc changes, uh, they can become on a new reality if they are going to last for a long period of time. So that means that the protracted conflict will indeed create a new reality that will be hard to change. Uh, but if we're talking about Russia and Iran uh, relations, it is still uh, relations that are built up on a case by case basis. So we definitely see Russia being dependent on Iran's uh, forces on, in Syria. Uh, but at the same time, we still see Russia is not ready to get part of the uh, Iran-Israeli uh, confrontation. Uh, we, uh, uh, as I mentioned, we see uh, Russia being completely interested in cooperation with the GCC studies and to a certain extent it's ready to make certain sacrifices. It's always a kind of uh, uh, a game where Russia is making it moves based on a very pragmatic approach. So the war just opened some new avenues and increased the importance of, of, of the Gulf for, for Moscow. Among the probably most positive changes here that Russia stopped seeing like uh, Gulf being uh, split. So now it's trying to create more or less balanced policies, um, trying to playing between all players, Iran, GCC, Iraq, 
Um, but uh, still, at the same time, the alliance which is created, uh, the partnership which is created, it's not uh, built on a solid base. So it's built as a friendship against, but it's not built on the kind of uh, ideological vision which is close, though again it's forming. And the Western element is getting more and more close, but at the same time, uh, as like the recent events in Iran and certain changes in their foreign policy showing they don't want to be the part of this global confrontation. Even in case with Ukraine, in the first day or so of the war, uh, there was a substantial uh, like uh, statements of support said by, by, by the Iranian leadership, uh, apart from the, the Supreme Leader, um, by Iranian politicians, let me formulate it in this way. Uh, and uh, actually the public opinion changed uh, only uh, after the 7th of October. So when Iran considered uh, Ukraine supporting Israel. And that's what, what, what was indeed a kind of a watershed. But even before that, it was still trying, you know, to, 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 to uh, at least to hide, not to demonstrate openly this growing military cooperation with Russia. Um, S4, S400, Su-35, uh, I have quite a specific vision on this. So for me, it's like a beacon that are diverting our attention from the reality. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, the Ukrainian experience showed that the wing of any planes can be just a good target for a cheap drones that can be destroyed immediately. Plus, a wing of Su-35 supplied to Iran is not going to change the balance of power in the region. What's going to change is exactly the very grassroots cooperation that's going and to which we are not paying attention. It's training missions, it's Intel information exchange. Uh, it is uh, cooperation in the building up the uh, military industrial capacities that's happening. And by the way, Iran is not only exception. I remember like in the mid 2010s, uh, after another trip, I guess it was Putin who traveled to Saudi Arabia, uh, in 2017, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the journalists were constantly calling me and saying, whether Russia is going to supply S-400s to Saudi Arabia. And no one called me and asked, what's going to happen with the assembly line of Kalashnikov that Russia is going to supply to, to Saudi Arabia? And what's much more dangerous, uh, not the dangerous, what's much more affecting the regional situation? 10,000 Kalashnikov that you can give, her, say, to your proxies, or just a division of S-400 that can be easily has it destroyed with, uh, within the fully fledged conflict. So that's what we should look at. But if you allow me, I'm not going to go too deep into it. We are on the record today. So, and uh, finally, uh, interaction with the Axis. It falls within the same approach and within the same logic of Russia. So can, uh, working on case by case, whether it's needed or not. So it's trying not to be the part of the axis of resistance, but it's trying to exploit its elements. So in Syria in 2015 and 2016, the Russian special forces were making military operations together with, the, with Hezbollah. Sometimes they were dressing in the uniform of Hezbollah, sometimes they were fighting together with the Hezbollah. But should we call them the partners? No. The Houthis uh, were in the margin of the Russian foreign policy until Putin decided that the asymmetric war should go beyond Ukraine and beyond the West. So, and that's how we start seeing the symbols. Again, we are on the record, let me put in this phrase, of alleged presence of the Russian instructors in Yemen. Uh, so, um, but again, we're dealing with a very pragmatic power here. And again, it's fitting in the region. Look, uh, I don't want to, like, to, 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 to still has a chance to, to answer the hand, but, uh, in short, we see the same pragmatic from the, the, the Gulf side. The war opened options to profit, politically, economically, ideologically, and with the certain disappointment in the United States that exists in this region, the diversification of relations implies interaction with Russia and China, whether we like it or not. And that's where I probably should stop. Thank you. So um, you all had a chance to address a question, but Li Chen and Ali, um, we didn't um, didn't have a chance to respond, and we are going to wrap up now. So I'll give you a chance to give any uh, final comments. Li Chen? You went some more? <laughs> Nikolai wants more time. No, 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 I don't want time. I want time for... Uh, no, no, it's okay. You can... <laughs> but, you know, uh, uh, I have been asked about uh, Biloba, who is the 
formal the official commissioner for the uh, she is the Russian commissioner for the rights of the child in Russia but Qatar dealed with her also but not only with her Qatar also dealed uh, yes yesterday uh, Qatar hosted an Ukrainian delegation in Doha to address oppressing oppressing humanitarian issues and during that meeting with the Ukrainian Parliament Commissioner for the Human Rights, uh, Dmitro Lopins, Minister of the State for the International Cooperation at the Qatari Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Lulu Al Khater, emphasized Qatar's dedication to fostering a neutral platform for humanitarian engagement. Discussions led to specific agreements on assisting civilians in difficult situations, including efforts to expedite the restoration of personal uh, documents. So Qatar is dealing with the officials, people, whether they are from Ukraine or from, uh, from uh, Russia. You know, we cannot uh, say that, uh, I feel that, uh, and in these panels today, we uh, we saw that there is one direction for one. Okay, I have emotions with Ukraine. I'm against any invasion of any country, and I respect borders. And uh, but you know, this frozen conflict it's not since 2024. I mean, 2022 February 22. Neither no, uh, since 2014. It is a, a historical problem which is existence in that region. Uh, you know, to, for, uh, for me, I think that, I, I, I want to speak in general about uh, this issue. Uh, we have to know here in the Middle East, we have to know what is the history of Russia. Where did Russia start as a country? And then we will, we will maybe understand why is Russia is insisting on Ukrainian case. Ukrainian, of course, Ukrainian country is, it has his sovereignty in the world, but also for understanding Russian position, for understanding Russian's policy on Ukrainian case, we have to study the Russian history. From where Russia started as a country, as, a, uh, as an entity in the world, it was from Kiev. Let's be honest, this is the reality. We cannot uh, hide the reality with, in saying that, uh, no, this is, uh, the, the, uh, Russia doesn't exist. Uh, Russia, it is a weakened country. Uh, Russia, it has too many problems and they have, they, they don't have the rights to, uh, to uh, make uh, an invasion. I am against the invasion uh, of Russia against Ukrainian, but, the mismanagement of uh, uh, some Western countries, manipulation that has been done by the states against the European countries led to that problem. Uh, Russia did a mistake, maybe in Ukraine. Yes, I agree with you. But we, I think that some European countries underestimated Russia and they underestimated the history of Russia and that region. Uh, we have to review the uh, policy, uh, uh, how to deal with Russia. Uh, we cannot expect that, uh, you know, some people, they said, uh, okay, Russia is not a democratic uh, country, uh, okay, but you know, uh, I think that uh, uh, there are some sort of democracies maybe in Russia, but it's not a full democracy. I agree with that. Russia anyway, it cannot be a full democracy because uh, it is a complicated thing, a, a, a complicated country in that region. And uh, you know, it was, it was an essay, it was a test in Russia during Boris Yeltsin's era when the democracy was applied in Russia, it, Russia, it was a big failure. 
It was a failed country in that region. And uh, they didn't succeed in anything. A very weakened country. With the presence of Putin, now Russian people, they think that Putin is giving their country an important role in the world. If you see the last uh, poll which has, which, which has been uh, done by Levada Center in Russia, the vast majority of Russian people, they are with the ceasefire of this crisis. But at the same time, they are with keeping the control of some parts of Lugansk, Donetsk, Kherson, and Zaporozhye under the Russian uh, troops. That's why I said that we have to review this history between Russia and Ukraine. It is a co very complicated thing. Thank you. We need to wrap up, but I do want to give Lee Chin the opportunity to answer, uh, to answer one final question in closing, since you didn't get to answer any audience questions. Uh, how are the GCC states managing the economic pressures from the war, particularly in the context of energy price volatility? And have any specific policies been enacted to leverage the situation for longer term gains? OK, great. Um, good question. So um, I think the, vol the price volatility issue, it doesn't concern all the Gulf states, right? It concerns some more than others. Volati volatility, of course, is an issue, but I think some more than others. So the, the best example I can give you is um, the Saudis, for example, right? So um, uh, the, the oil price, they need to balance their budgets. It's around $90 um, for 2024, 25. But if you add in the um, amounts that are spent by the public, um, the, the fund, right, the PIF, the Public Investment Fund, um, that comes up to about $110 right, dollars, um, per barrel. So that's a $20 difference between the fiscal balance and uh, adding in what, what PIF spends on the, the big projects in Saudi. So yes, um, Saudis will be very concerned with the oil price, but at the same time, I don't think they really mind it too much for a few years because Saudis are very used to running deficits, right? Um, they've been running deficits for, for many, many years. And I think in the past, like, I think 12 years, there was only one year where they had a surplus, right? So, so they're used to finding, uh, funding deficits through, through debt, and the debt is very low. So the oil prices do concern some Gulf states, right? Um, but there, there are ways that the, the more prosperous ones, let's say, say, can manage it, right? So by having alternative investments, um, equity investments in the developed countries, et cetera. Um, so I, for me, I, I don't think it's too much of a concern of that volatility. Uh, what they would really like to see, I think in general, is stability in the region, right? So it's not so much oil price, but more like the, the general regional stability because that can bring in um, foreign direct investment. Uh, it's not just the oil story. It's the steel story, it's the aluminum story, it's a renewable story. So um, I think that's more important. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you to all of our speakers for the panel. Um, I want to note that we do not have a, a scheduled break at the moment, but we do need a couple of minutes just to shuffle the speakers and rearrange the mic. So please don't go anywhere, and we'll be right back for the next panel. <laughs>